At the end of the question period, uh, we restrict questions to members and to uh, the Oregon AIDS Task Force uh, members as well. And uh, either group will be uh, encouraged and asked to, to address questions to our speaker today. When I think of San Francisco, I think of uh, Fisherman's Wharf and the cable cars and Market Street, and Broadway and North Beach and Haight-Ashbury. But San Francisco is also uh, one of the first areas in the U.S. to identify the significance of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. The San Francisco General Hospital is one of the best treatment facilities uh, in the nation for AIDS. Our speaker today has said, if I had AIDS anywhere west of the Mississippi, I'd crawl to San Francisco. But, but it's not just a San Francisco problem. Yesterday's Oregonian brings us information that uh, there were 51 AIDS cases in Oregon, and there have been 18 deaths in Oregon since 1981. Here to address us is a person of unique qualifications. With an MD uh, from uh, Tulane, uh, Master of Public Health from Harvard. He spent time at the Federal Drug Administration and was director of the Wichita County Health Director before becoming the director of health for San Francisco from 1977 to January of 1985. In that capacity, he was directly involved in the expenditures of several million dollars of city money for AIDS. He was uh, involved in a very controversial issue, the closure of, of uh, bathhouses in San Francisco. Uh, he has worked extensively on education of AIDS uh, sufferers and the public. Dr. Silverman, if AIDS is transferred through bodily fluids, then must I be uh, wary of my lover's tears? Which of the, uh, uh, with the Department of Health and Human Services guidelines yesterday, can we expect Congressman Dan Meyer to go away? What, what do we make of uh, heterosexual transmissions in Africa? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Silverman. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, going from tears to Dan Meyer to Africa is quite a trip, and hopefully I can cover that uh, today. In fact, I'm leaving uh, after this talk to go back to San Francisco to debate Congressman Dan Meyer tonight, the League of Women Voters, so it should be a very interesting uh, session. What I want to do today is to talk about the epidemic of AIDS and actually the two epidemics that we're faced with. One is certainly the tragic disease, AIDS, which I think many of you are familiar with through the media and through the work that's being done by the AIDS Task Force. And the other is what has been referred to by some as APES, A-I-P-S, AIDS-Induced Panic Syndrome. And we're seeing this. It's, it's incredible what we're seeing around the nation, and it's somewhat deja vu for me and for those of us from San Francisco, because in 1983, we saw that level of anxiety in San Francisco. Uh, my phone was ringing all day long as when I was director of health at that time. Uh, can I accept a piece of paper? I work in the court. Uh, can I accept a piece of paper from someone who might have AIDS? Can I ride in a bus, eat in a restaurant, uh, swim in a pool? All of those things. And the more we tried to calm the fears, the worse they got. And I woke up one morning and was uh, astounded that it finally came to me why there was all this anxiety. First of all, government, as you know, is painted with a broad brush, whether it's local, state, or federal government. And uh, here was government saying not to worry. The same government that said don't worry about Three Mile Island, don't worry about Love Canal, don't worry about this. I mean, I've never heard the government say worry about anything, uh, except maybe the deficit. And they don't, sometimes there's not that much worry there. Uh, then we had a disease, we didn't have a cause, we weren't quite sure of the transmission, we didn't have a cure, we didn't have a vaccine, and it was universally fatal. Well, certainly those are the ingredients of anxiety, if there ever would be. So we set about to develop a program in San Francisco to educate 
not only the at-risk communities, but the entire community, and to set up a program which would meet the needs, which grew as the needs grew. And I would like to, before getting into the rest of this, just give you a brief overview of what we did do in San Francisco. When we started seeing the first cases in 1981, uh, we established a reporting system, and in fact, a case registry for AIDS. And all the cases were interviewed and followed up as best we could at that time. We tried to establish liaisons between private physicians, hospitals, the Center for Disease Control, so that we would have good reporting and so we'd have interaction back and forth on this developing new disease. In 1982, in October of 82, we established the multidisciplinary clinic, AIDS clinic, at San Francisco General Hospital known as Ward 86. And this was not just for outpatient services, I mean, just clinical services. There was screening, diagnosis, follow-up, education, and counseling. And we found out early that counseling was most important. And as the number of cases increased, we increased the number of screening clinics around the city. And then in 1983, we opened the AIDS ward. And when it was brought to my attention with a request to open this up at our hospital, I was reluctant at first because I didn't want to further isolate people who were being isolated by this disease. I was convinced otherwise and very glad that I was because the ward is absolutely incredible. When you talk to patients on that ward, you hear words like, I feel safe, I feel confident, I feel happy, I, uh, it, and that's incredible when you see the kinds of conditions uh, that these patients have uh, when they're in this ward. The more people signed up to work on the ward than we had spaces, and so the care is compassionate, there is counseling, there is someone assigned to each person on the ward from the Shanti Project, which I'll mention in a minute, to give counseling and support. And it has really been a great success. And unfortunately, as the disease numbers have increased, we are in the process now of expanding that to twice its size. Now, as we moved on, we developed a number of other programs. And although we didn't provide the services directly we tried most of the time to do this through the community uh, we did do most of the funding and the coordination uh, there were social services advocacy and emergency housing a lot of people were being thrown out of their places of residence either by their lovers uh, by landlords or because they could no longer pay the rent because they they were uh, too weak to work we provided long-term housing home health care and chore worker services in the home, whether it was transportation, uh, washing clothes, washing, uh, uh, cleaning the place, providing food, shopping, those sorts of things. Uh, practical support for daily living. We set up an extended care skilled nursing facility. Uh, we uh, provided uh, more emotional support and advocacy for the patients who were inpatients at San Francisco General Hospital. We added mental health support to all the activities at the hospital and throughout the city. We had training and support for the mental health professionals so that they could be up to date in what they were doing with these patients and also to work with them because it's very difficult, as I'm sure you can imagine, working with patients, young people, in the process of dying. We did uh, created a youth outreach program because there's a lot of one runaway boys that come to San Francisco and are on the streets hustling and are really unaware of the problems that they could be facing. We did involved, got involved in substance abuse counseling, not only for people with AIDS, but again, training for the staff. And then the AIDS Health Project, which is a very important one that provides psychological and general health assessments with emphasis on those things that tend to diminish or depress the immune system and got support groups focusing on prevention of depression and stress and the promotion of safe sexual practices. Well, over the years, that fear throughout the community and the support that this community has given, and it's been great support from the citizens, from the executive branch, from the legislative branch of the, of the city, and that anxiety went down. Well, this summer with Rock Hudson's announcement, the anxiety level came back up, and that came also at a time right when the uh, schools, kids were going back to school and some might have AIDS. If I could have the switch on in the back, this political cartoon came out at the beginning of, the, of this school thing, and in a sense, it's sort of a quiz that I'd like to give to you, and I'll read it so people can see. There's a little boy on the left, and it says AIDS. 
a little a woman with some in some hysteria on the right that says AIDS hysteria, and the question is which can be transmitted by casual contact. Now, I hope by the end of my talk, uh, the answer will be obvious. We can turn that off now. As I mentioned, there are a number of elements of anxiety. If you stop and think about it, this is a sexually transmitted disease. We don't do very well dealing with sexually transmitted diseases. I'm sure at the table today, someone might say to you, do you know I had the flu last week? The odds are they're not gonna say they had gonorrhea last week. Uh, we don't deal with this, we don't talk about this. So sexually transmitted diseases create anxiety. The fact that it's been predominantly in the homosexual community provides anxiety for some individuals who are not sure about what gay lifestyle is all about or who are absolutely homophobic. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. There's a long incubation period, and that's scary because people always say, well, how do you really know if it's going to take so long before we see the results of this? And it's terminal for most cases. Now, I think any one of those elements is enough to produce anxiety in any one of us uh, at certain points in time. What adds to this, unfortunately, and I think even makes it worse, are misinformed, uninformed, or misguided physicians who speak as if they are talking as health professionals, but in reality, many times are not. In Houston, Texas, three physicians walked into the council meeting there with their white coats on, their stethoscopes suitably draped, uh, I'm sure a few tongue blades, and mentioned that they were uh, from, they were on the clinical staff at Baylor and then proceeded to say that no one should shake hands with a stranger because you could get AIDS from the perspiration on your hands. Um, we have um, physicians who haven't followed the information making statements and that I think adds to the confusion because we, if we can't believe in what physicians are telling us about a medical problem, who can we believe in? Then of course we go up a little further and we have the President of the United States standing up at a news conference stating that his experts have told him that this disease is only spread one of two of the obvious ways, the intimate sharing of fluids through uh, sexual relations or sharing IV needles. He didn't go into that, but that's what he was referring to. And so probably there wasn't a risk for kids, but you know, if he was a parent, he wouldn't be so sure because the physicians aren't too sure. And here is a man whose administration has had made some of the greatest strides in AIDS research in the world, has some of the top researchers, and not one of them believes for a minute that it's casually spread or that children would be at risk in most situations. So you have that Dana Meyer, who you heard about, who is looking for all kinds of legislation that I think would be very repressive uh, and restrictive and would not produce the results. And I should say that if I thought for a minute when I was director of health that this disease was casually spread, I would have probably instituted the most draconian types of controls and civil liberties, civil rights would not have been an issue. We would have, we would have had a major issue in, in easy contagion and that action would have been taken if it were smallpox, if it were typhoid, whatever. It isn't any of those. The problems are that we face healthcare workers. Now, if we stop and think about it, except for those two types of exposure, healthcare workers are the ones who are going to come the closest to being in, in an intimate setting, whether it's handling the sheets, uh, certainly handling needles and getting stuck. Out of 1,700 healthcare workers that have been followed, and there's certainly at least double that number today, um, only three have possibly converted as a, to their blood test to a positive test as a result of their professional activities, possibly. One woman in England, definite, she was drawing blood on a person, she accidentally pumped that blood into herself, uh, which is like a mini transfusion or sharing needles. She came down with a, an acute illness that we now see is seen in patients who have just been infected and then went on about 47 days later to get the positive blood test. She does not have AIDS. Not one healthcare worker to date has AIDS. And uh, there are probably 150,000 or more healthcare workers in this country who have come in direct contact, whether they were laundry workers, orderlies, drawing blood, doing surgery, what have you. Not one has gotten AIDS. Three in this country possibly have gotten a positive blood test. 
and we, I'm a member of the Infection Control Committee of the University of California in San Francisco. We came up with the original guidelines several years ago. We looked at them again last week, found out they were pretty good, and at the end of our meeting, <coughs> pardon me, realized that what we were really saying about infection control was for AIDS is that if you practice good infection control in doctor's offices and in hospitals that you do for any type of infection, you will be protecting yourself against the spread of AIDS. Soap and water, a 10 to one-tenth to 100 percent dilution of Clorox, uh, uh, heat 56 degrees centigrade for 10 minutes, uh, any of these things will kill the virus. The virus is a very fragile virus. In fact, that's why it is basically a sexually transmitted disease. It isn't because the virus has any prurient interests. It's because, <laughs> it's because it, like gonorrhea and syphilis, don't live well outside the body, need the warm, moist, close environment for it to be transmitted from one individual to another. Don't have that situation, and you're not placing yourself at risk for AIDS. Children in schools, certainly a scary thought. And certainly in nursery schools where maybe a child is a biter, that could be a problem. But I think what we forget many times is to look at the child, him or herself, who has AIDS. And what does it mean for that child to be going to school? And that's why I think each situation ought to be looked at carefully. Because if you have an insensitive teacher who isolates the child, children who taunt the child, a child who's already going through the throes of having AIDS, uh, I don't think that's healthy for the child. If you have a, an enlightened principal, teacher, students, it may and certainly should be the best way to deal with it, to have the child in school going to school. I don't think we'll ever, especially because of the President's statements, ever really deal with this in the proper way, and I think that's really unfortunate. Another area is the area of prostitution. At San Francisco General Hospital at the AIDS Clinic on a Friday afternoon at 4.30, a prostitute was brought in by a policeman, a vice squad policeman, and a gay reporter. Now, if you want to talk about strange bedfellows, uh, that certainly would be it. Uh, brought this prostitute in to be tested at 4.30 in the afternoon. Obviously, that was not possible. And even if tests were done, then the results wouldn't be available. She made the statement basically that regardless of whether she got tested or not, and in essence, regardless of whether she had AIDS, she would be back on the streets over the weekend because she had to feed herself and her little daughter and, of course, clothe and house themselves. And I think this points up an issue that goes far beyond AIDS, and that is what alternatives are we providing? How are we dealing with this issue? If a person doesn't feel they have alternatives, and certainly many in poverty don't, and many who are resorting to prostitution don't, what are we doing? And one of the things we're certainly doing with the way we're treating it now is guaranteeing the spread uh, through the heterosexual population. I believe it was in Florida, a judge ordered a prostitute to stay at home. Who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to buy the food? I don't think they have workman's comp yet uh, or, uh, you know, uh, sick leave for prostitutes. And so I think it's something that as a society we have to look at. Another is the area of IV drug abuse. Um, we in this society have made IV drug abuse a criminal problem rather than the medical issue that it is. Someone who's addicted to drugs has a medical problem. We make it criminal because they're not allowed to possess the drugs. We make it criminal because they have to steal quite often to get money for the drugs. And now we, of course, say that in order to keep IV drug abuse down, we will not allow them to have access to clean syringes and needles. And we are pretty much guaranteeing with that policy that we are going to kill a number of them uh, with AIDS. Uh, in, in Australia, interestingly enough, the health department is providing sterile needles and syringes to the drug abusing community. And I was down there a few weeks ago and talking to some addicts, and we asked them how do they find their needles, and they showed us. They went over to a park and started groveling in the dirt. And we said, well, when do you, how do you use them? He said, well, if it's wet, we just use it. And if it isn't, we wash it out. And he said, but aren't you worried about getting AIDS? And he says, all we're worried about is getting the next fix. I mean, that isn't an issue. I mean, they're shooting up stuff they don't know what it is anyway. So AIDS is, is not a major issue. The next fix is. So it's an issue that goes beyond AIDS of how we're dealing with that and probably the subject of several more uh, meetings of the city club. The other issue is quarantine, and this is a big one. Of course, quarantine originally referred to when the ship came into the port, and if it came from a place where there was disease, you kept it 
out in the water for 40 days and 40 nights, and if no one got in sick on board, you then let them come in because they would no longer be, or there would be no risk to the population. Uh, what we're talking about is isolation, and there have been calls to isolate people with AIDS. Now, again, if that was a real source of spread of the disease to everyone, that would make a lot of sense. It is not, and in fact, those who have frank AIDS are less infectious than those who have gotten a positive blood test and are incubating the disease. Uh, most people, when they have frank AIDS, have destroyed a lot of their immune system, so there aren't the cells for which the, uh, in which the virus can replicate, and therefore there's not many floating around in body fluids to infect others. Also, many people with AIDS are quite weak, and sex is not a big thought on their mind at that time. So if you think, well, then let's isolate those with a positive blood test, that's been estimated to be between a million and a million and a half people. And uh, that, that, I think they had that movie, Escape from New York, where all of New York City was a prison. That's pretty much what you'd have to do. But if you stop and think about it, the real way in which we can deal with this disease is through education and information. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine. Our only defense is through education and information. And basically, because I think we've taken care of the transfusion problem with the test, we've taken care of hemophilias with the treatment of the hemophiliacs with the treatment of the products, this disease is now a disease of consenting adults. If you don't place yourself in the two risk situations that I mentioned, you won't get AIDS. So rather than worrying about isolating thousands of people, let's educate people so they won't make the wrong decision and place themselves in a situation where they will get AIDS. This blood test has gotten to be a, certainly a double-edged sword. It has cleaned up the blood supply, but it's being used now for many other purposes, insurance companies, businesses. Uh, the military initially said they were only going to test recruits. Then they said, no, we will test everybody, but don't worry. If we find out through the testing that you're gay or that you've used drugs, we won't take any action. And then in the terms of Vietnam, uh, a week later they said that's not operational anymore. Uh, if you're found out to be gay or an IV drug abuser, you will be kicked out of the military. Um, the people who originally came down with AIDS in the military uh, were discharged, not because they had AIDS, but because they were gay. So I think there's a lot of talk about doing things in the interest of public health, but I think there are, in many instances, ulterior motives. And one of the things I think will happen that people, I think, sometimes don't think about, and that is the people who are participating the most in research are the people in the high-risk groups, and that's predominantly people in the gay community. If there is more repressive and restrictive actions as a result of the results of these tests, fewer people will serve, if you will, as guinea pigs, and it'll take longer for us to get the answers to this disease rather than reducing the problem. And if it made sense, I think, as I say, if the spread were easy, then you take other means. It is not casually spread, and so to take these kinds of repressive actions, I think, is, mis is, is real misdirection. The final area that I think is important, as far as the social implications, is the psychological issues, and certainly there are a great many. There are certainly many issues that gay men are going through just as virtue of their gayness and dealing with their family and dealing with others, and then they're at, they're at the prime of their life when life should be taking off after college, after school, after training, what have you, and they have to look as young men towards death, towards telling their family for the first time that not only are they gay, but they have AIDS. Uh, dealing with the religious issues. Many probably don't want to believe Falwell, but sometimes down deep feel, well, maybe this is God's retribution. While all this is going on, as I say, they're facing death, and the, the psychological impact is incredible, which it is on healthcare workers who deal with them every day. So some very serious issues. The economic impact, fantastic. Uh, the first 9,000 cases, it's been estimated that 7,500 years of lost work due to disability uh, have, have happened thus far with $162 million lost in the economy. Loss of future earnings due to premature death, $4 billion. Health care cost, $1.28 billion for a total of about four, no, about $5.4 billion. And that doesn't include outpatient visits to private physicians or to clinics or to nonprofit uh, entities that are providing counseling. 
So we are talking about a very, very expensive problem and one that's going to get more expensive, not only in human suffering, certainly, but in dollars and cents. I think the main three things to think about uh, when we're dealing with this are cooperation, coordination, and education. To cooperate with the communities that are directly involved and nationally, as you know, it's about 73% homosexual and bisexual males, about 17% IV drug abusers, 2% transfusion, 1% hemophilia, 1% heterosexual sexual contact, a few percentage of unknowns, most of whom we have not gotten good histories on, but feel sure they would fall in the other categories. So to work especially with the gay community, to cooperate with them in getting the messages out, to coordinate activities with all the affected parties, and of course the most important is to educate and inform. If we did a good job of that, if people responded to that, we could literally stop the spread of AIDS tomorrow. Can't say that about too many diseases. Couldn't stop the flu. We couldn't stop uh, smallpox at that time when it was around. Uh, but we could stop AIDS, the spread, tomorrow if people got the information, heeded the information, and didn't place themselves at risk. So I guess the slide back there, I don't know if we need to put it on again, but I hope that uh, you can answer the test that uh, that had on it. Thank you, and I'll answer any questions you might have. Our first Vice President, Susan Graber, has the first question. Susan? I'm not the first Vice President yet, okay. unless Steve has just resigned. I don't know if this is good news or bad. Uh, Dr. Silverman, you raised both uh, political and medical issues in your speech, and I want to address uh, the latter. You mentioned several times that there is no cure and no vaccine. What is the state of research, and how close are we or how far are we from a cure? Well, there are two types of treatment that we are, have to do. We have to provide treatment for those who have the intercurrent infections or the tumors that we see as a result of having a compromised immune system. And I think we've been relatively successful in, in causing remissions in a number of these areas. The problem is that that does nothing, pardon me, to deal with the underlying problem, which is a viral infection that is destroying the immune system. And therefore, we have to get an antiviral agent that will work without being so toxic to the individual. And we have to have an immune modulator, something that will cause the immune system to improve. If we give the immune modulator too soon, we actually cause more problems because we provide more cells for the virus. Uh, what we need to do, if you think of it as a continuum of illness from infection where you have a positive blood test, through possibly AIDS-related conditions and over to frank AIDS, most not getting over here, probably 85 to 90 percent not getting over here, we're trying the drugs out over here and not being terribly successful, but that is the most prudent way to try them. What we hope to do is move that treatment, that antiviral treatment, further back, if you will, along that infection to the point where we can get rid of the virus before the immune system has been destroyed. How close are we? I'd like to believe within the next few years, but we've been saying that for the last few years. A vaccine is going to take a while. There are some changes on the surface of the virus, which makes developing a, vi a vaccine that will take care of all the viruses. Um, so we, I think uh, it's Tony Fauci from the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Disease said the other night on NBC that he thought it would be available in two years. I hope he's right. Yes, and the microphone. Yes, Janet Smith. Janet Smith at the, at the City Club. I have a question related to the issue, issue of physician credibility that you mentioned earlier and related to the subject of research. Over the past couple of months, I have spoken to two different individuals directly involved in the development of cures for AIDS. And these people are convinced that they have cures and they are AIDS patients are currently being treated. Um, according to their approaches. Uh, apparently they're, being, they're doing very well. I'm not in a position to evaluate that. They, the problem is that they come from outside the mainstream medical research establishment 
and they apparently haven't been able to get the attention of the medical establishment. I wondered if you had come across any such uh, claims yourself and whether you'd be willing to investigate the ones that I've found. Well, I get a lot of calls and letters, as do the researchers and the clinicians at San Francisco General Hospital, I'm sure at hospitals all over the country, with people with ideas, some of which may be good. And if they look plausible, there are attempts being made in a number of areas to institute some studies. The problem is an anecdotal kind of thing, which we see a lot. We saw it with Laetrile. We see it with a number of other drugs, is not the answer. You must do a good double-blind study so that you really see whether the drug is having its effects. I know some people have complained that the drugs haven't come fast enough. I think the government is moving quite fast. People have felt if they're going to die anyway, why not take any drug? And although it sounds plausible on the surface, we hope that we'll be able to keep people alive until we have a good cure. Uh, we'd hate to see people killing themselves with drugs. The cyclosporin that you saw coming out from France, which I think was the most unethical press conference I've ever seen. Uh, here we have a breakthrough. We've had two cases in seven days. Uh, and of course, most of them died. And that, uh, if, I mean, those two died and others have died in the study. Even if they hadn't died, to come out with that causes such false hope uh, that I think it's, it's a problem. And it, and it gets people that want to try and get a hold of these drugs to get a hold of anything. Actually, that could be more detrimental to them than waiting or working out or doing things in medical centers where they can get proper treatment. I just wanted to follow up. This, this is the approaches that I'm relating to do not come from pharmaceutical houses. They are drugless approaches. Well, I think drugless approaches are fine. Uh, and in fact, there have been another imaging and a number of programs like that. And I think I know the, the people at San Francisco General Hospital encourage that. And they're not discouraging that. Whether they could do a whole study on that is something we'd have to see. There has to be quite often for some of those things funding, and it's a little more difficult to do a double blind in that kind of a situation. But I don't think most of us who are on the, working on the front lines would discourage anyone from trying the drugless approaches, the various types of psychological, if you will, approaches and good health approaches to uh, cure. John? Tom Higgins, City Club member. You, uh, Dr. Silverman, you discuss the limited ways in which uh, one can be exposed to the uh, AIDS virus. Of w what's the current uh, research show with respect to the question of how many people or what percentage of people who are exposed to the virus actually go on to contract AIDS? And, and related to that, what are your personal views with respect to uh, widespread testing for, the, uh, for exposure to the virus? Okay, the number of people who, and we say exposure, and that, that's a little confusing. I think we probably, and I use the term myself, it's, we should say those who are infected with the virus, uh, approximately 10% will go on to, to have frank AIDS. Uh, we're hopeful that in working with patients who, who are infected that we can build up the immune system and build up the health so that many of them don't go on. And that brings up a subject which is controversial, and that is whether people in high-risk groups should be tested. Originally, I was against it. I am now for it because I think the test is a good one. But I'm not talking about screening, and I am talking about anonymous testing, where you go in and there is no identification of you by name or birth date or what have you, or social security number, so that you can be sure of anonymity with those results. And I think it can be helpful. It's, it looked like it's worked quite well in, in Australia, because if you can get people in, you may help change, further change behavior. We've gotten a tremendous behavior change. We still have further to go. Uh, we can also help to work with the patients so that they don't infect others or become infected themselves if they're negative. And hopefully, if we come about with some medications, with some drugs that are helpful in the early stages, we'll be able to use those on these individuals and have a positive effect. So I think not through screening, but through voluntary, through anonymous settings, I, I recommend people in high-risk groups, unless they're very unstable, and, and finding out the information would be very detrimental to them mentally, uh, encourage them to get the test. Yes. Yeah, Kirk Wilson, a City Club member. Uh, what exactly does it mean to be tested positive for AIDS? And, and secondly, uh, what do people with AIDS actually die of when they do die? All right, people are not 
tested for AIDS, they are tested for the infection of the virus, by the virus. And to be positive means that your body has taken in the virus, your immune system has responded, and made antibodies. Unfortunately, these antibodies tend not to be neutralizing, so they don't kill off the virus. The virus continues to grow and replicate in the body. Uh, so that is uh, what a positive, what an infection, what a positive test was in the second part of that. Uh, Oh, what do patients actually die of? Usually they die of one of the opportunistic infections or the cancer, the Kaposi sarcoma, or both. Well, often it can be a wasting disease where they lose, it has to do with an, another opportunistic infection. An opportunistic infection being uh, infected with organisms that we normally carry around with us, but because our immune systems are okay, we don't have a problem with them. When our immune systems are depressed, then we become sus subject to them. And in fact, people who have been medically suppressed, uh, their immune systems medically suppressed with regard to renal transplant, heart transplant, quite often we will see the same kind of cancer or some of the same infections. And if you stop the immune suppression, the infection goes away or the cancer goes away. Unfortunately, quite often so does the patient because uh, the body rejects uh, the, the organ that is in the body. But it's usually these infections that come on after the person has a compromised immune system that does the patient in. Gretchen? Gretchen Kafori, City Club. Uh, recently, a number of county employees were down at the conference, National County Association Conference, and a speaker from the Center for Disease Control gave the very positive report that the percentage, you'd mentioned the risk categories and who was getting AIDS, but the percentage of heterosexual uh, incidents is not increasing by any, that anyone can tell. So that must mean that that, that fear factor should, hopefully will be able to public educate and not have people as hysterical as they've been. But I guess Steve's question about the uh, incidence of AIDS in Africa. I haven't reconciled in my own mind what that heterosexual incidence means in terms of, of our system, and I'm delighted we aren't increasing that percentage, but what, what is the relationship? All right, I think I should cl make clear the numbers are increasing. You're right, the percentages aren't. And in fact, the fact that those percentages stay the same in those groups is another indication why it's not casually spread, or we'd see it in mothers of people with AIDS and families, and we just don't see that. So I think that uh, there's no question that it is not casually spread. Those categories show it. In, but the, the virus doesn't differentiate between sexes or sexual preference. If you put yourself at risk, heterosexual or homosexual or bisexual, you can uh, be, you can certainly be at risk and come down with the disease. In Africa, there seems to be a great deal of, you use the term promiscuity amongst those who have gotten it. Many of the men have had many, many encounters, sometimes with the same prostitute or just with many of them. A number of the women have had multiple partners. Uh, so it's, it seems that, uh, and there may be other I issues that we're not sure of with the use of needles and other things uh, that causes that. But it is, there, we are not immune as heterosexuals from getting this disease uh, if we place ourselves at risk. And I hope that we are getting through to people. I don't know. Well, we're going to have to see. The reason why I keep harping on the same control, the same safe sex guidelines for gays or straights is that I don't want to look two years down the road and look back and say, I wish we had done more because now we have such a large number in the heterosexual community. We've had enough tragedy in the gay community. We don't need to spread it anywhere else. We need to control it everywhere. Yes, ma'am. Edith Zabin, a member of the City Club. Dr. Silverman, you said this was not a strong virus. It was a weak virus. Then how does it break down the immune system if it's such a weak virus? Well, when I talk about weak or strong, I'm talking about, you know, I, I, some people picture this virus as like something from a Steve King, Stephen King movie coming over the horizon and engulfing everybody and they come out with the tanks and nothing will kill this virus. It is a weak virus in as much as it is easily destroyed. That doesn't mean that it doesn't do its work quite effectively and that work is to get into the cell of the, uh, the T cell, which is so important in the immune system and ultimately destroy that cell. So it's a different way of looking at it. it is, 
It is not something that, that is resistant to every type of control. It is not. It's very susceptible, as I said, to a mild bleach solution, soap and water, heat. Uh, it is a weakling as a virus. It just happens to be efficient in what it does, and we have to find a way to make it inefficient. Mike? Um, my name is Woodruff English. I'm a physician in Portland and a member of the Organ AIDS Task Force. Uh, yesterday, uh, I received for the first time a request from an insurance company on one of my patients to fill out an elaborate questionnaire elicited, eliciting most of the signs and symptoms of AIDS and requests for blood tests which would indicate reasonable suspicion that the individual might have had an infection with the virus. Um, my question to you is, as a public health, former public health official and someone interested in, in policies, uh, firstly, what is your um, reaction to this as an ethical move on the part of insurance companies? And secondly, um, I think in certain areas of the country there have been efforts uh, legislatively to uh, put some constraints on this. Do you think this is appropriate? Two very good questions. Uh, I think it depends how it's used. I think certainly an insurance company has the right to know whether you have the AIDS disease as much as they would need to know if you have any other type of disease or, or cancer, and I don't think it's inappropriate to know that. I think to test everyone uh, becomes inappropriate if you use that test in a discriminatory way. I mean, when 90 percent of the people don't appear to go on to have AIDS, then to test everyone and not issue insurance or issue it at such a high premium that no one can afford it, I think is unethical. Uh, I know the insurance companies don't like to lose money. Uh, all you have to do is have auto insurance for 20 years and have an accident, and then sometimes you lose that policy. Uh, I don't think that's fair. So I think that the, uh, the use of that test uh, can be discriminatory, and it should not be used in that way. Now, as far as local legislation, uh, Los Angeles, I think West Hollywood, and San Francisco just recently has introduced anti-discriminatory legislation because it seemed obvious that many people were being discriminated. To be discriminated from work because you have a positive blood test makes no sense. It's not fair. You're certainly not going to protect the others at work site because they're not going to be exposed to it. You may be protecting some slight workman's compensation costs down the road, but you know there's many other things we could also test for if you're going to be employed. So I think the anti-discrimination types of legislation are very important because of the misuse that this test uh, has been placed and will be placed in other communities and is important because, especially in the insurance area, um, I'll give you one quick example. In Denver, a man who was getting his physical for his insurance, his doctor said, just for the heck of it, let's go on and do an antibody test. He was not in a high-risk group. He tested negative. He was refused insurance because they said as long as he took the test, he must have taken it since he thought he was in a high-risk group, and therefore they wouldn't cover him. Now, that's the kind of thing that I think we want to try and prevent. Yes, sir. Dennis Burke, City Club member. Uh, I believe I heard you earlier say that because the AIDS virus destroys the uh, antibody system, is this off? It's off. Okay. That uh, individuals are more inclined to catch, uh, people who have the AIDS virus are more inclined to catch other types of contagious uh, diseases. Is this in itself perhaps some reason for a mild amount of hysteria? Well, again, unfortunately, I think early on we felt that if you had that compromised immune system and you came close to someone who had a cold or something, you could get an overwhelming cold and die, like, like the bubble boy, that, that type of situation. We now find that the person is more at risk for himself uh, because of the things that he is normally carrying in his system that he then becomes vulnerable to. So it is not really an issue of his risk or her risk being out with other individuals, of catching some disease from them. It's usually catching it from yourself. And as I say, if we went and cultured most people in this room, we'd probably find most of the things that, uh, unfortunately, are killing people with AIDS. Herb? Herb Crane, a member of the City Club. Uh, recently, this week, I fa in fact, I believe, the Oregonian had a headline in a feature article indicating that someone who had received a blood transfusion subsequently developed a positive 
symptom, and I think ultimately contract. I think ultimately contracted AIDS. You also referred briefly to uh, the screening for that. My question is, can one, can the Red Cross or any donor agency screen blood samples? Must one first screen the donor? And are the donors being screened? Uh, is a transfusion, a public transfusion, still the risk that it was when this was a new and untried problem? All right, first of all, the risk, even when it, when it was new, was quite small, uh, very small numbers, probably one in, in a million in many communities. They started about two years ago with a self questionnaire which would eliminate many people who found themselves in high-risk groups. They then added in many, many um, blood banks a uh, test for hepatitis B. Then in March of this year, they came out with the ELISA test, which is used now through all blood banks, which further screens down, in fact, is throwing out a lot of good blood because there, is false, there are false positives. So I think the blood supply is very, very safe. The person who has come down with this, I'd be willing to bet, was transfused before all of this took place. There is, is that true? But let me say something. There are no absolutes in medicine, and I think we're all asking for absolutes. I have been asked on numerous occasions, can you guarantee that I won't have a reaction from blood? Can you guarantee that my child is absolutely safe? I can't guarantee that if you walk out of your house, you won't be struck by lightning. But based on the statistics, which have been very, very consistent, and we use statistics in order to determine our risk for most things, certainly in health, the risk for a transfusion is very, very small. Now, unfortunately, people have heard you can get blood from, you can get AIDS from donated blood, and they don't hear the ED, and they think it's ING, and a lot of people are staying away from blood banks because they're afraid they'll get AIDS from donating blood. And the reason I bring that up is the blood supply is going down tremendously because people are fearful that if they donate blood, they place themselves at risk. They do not. You're not at risk, and that's an absolute. That I can say with, with absolute certainty. Uh, and your risk of getting AIDS from a, from a transfusion is very small. If you're in a situation where a blood transfusion is a life-saving situation, and that's the only time to be getting a blood transfusion, please don't refuse that because you're afraid you're going to get AIDS. Now, I don't see anyone standing. I want to just really uh, reemphasize the importance of prevention, the importance of education and information. And I think Thomas Adams summed it up very well about 300 years ago when he said, prevention is so much better than healing because it saves the labor of being sick. Dr. Silverman, thank you very much for that most informative talk. Uh, remember next week, Lynn Curtis will be here to address us on violence questions. We're adjourned. <laughs>